This, as she was saying, is a, a tunnel that is not filled in yet. Like she said, it's not mud or anything else, it's air. Um, and it's big enough so someone to walk in and go, and there's a, a broken up one to the left of it. But this one that's down the middle, she said, it's pretty well preserved. And it goes down to the middle of the ship where there's a big rock, but this is below where that rock is. What was really interesting, she said that it opens up to a central um, uh, big void, like a big room, she called it. Andrew, we are very thankful to have you with us, and uh, we look forward to what you have to say. So Andrew Jones, he's coming to us from Turkey, so he's a few hours behind us, but he's ready to go, and so we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you guys for inviting me. Um, yeah, I was asked to give just a little background, how I got involved in this. Uh, when I was a kid, a teenager, early teens, in middle school, Ron Wyatt um, came out to Sacramento, California, where I'm from and gave a presentation on a school night. And because it was a school night, my father went instead of me. And he came back and said, hey, this guy said, you know, Noah's Ark has been found and Mount Sinai is in Arabia, et cetera. And so I wanted to know more about it. So I went and found out that he had a book and I bought it called Discover Noah's Ark. And back then, this was before the internet. So I ended up uh, calling 411 and got his phone number and the operator, uh, dialed me through and I was able to actually talk to Ron on the phone and that was in the early 90s and then until he passed away in 1999 I used to talk to him and his family a lot from the phone and I ended up going out to this site with uh, a gentleman named Bill Fry who had invited me to travel with him in 1997 so I was in the middle of college and I went out there and I saw it for the first time and then I came back in 2000 twice I met one of the Turkish scientists involved on that trip, Dr. Sali Barak Tutan, and that got me really interested um, hearing from him and how he believed it was actually you know, Noah's Ark. And so that kind of got my interest into it, but it wasn't until 2013 that I really started um, making a lot of trips over to Turkey. I ended up moving there um, during the pandemic, and my friend who I, I first met on that first trip in 1997, Zafir Onay, he uh, and I became lifelong friends, and he suggested when the pandemic hit, he said, hey, we don't know how long the borders will be closed. Why don't you just move here, and we can work on the Nozark project together? And so that's kind of where I've been basing my um, research and also doing tours for those who want to see these sites, whether you come on our tours or just show up. We do a lot of um, uh, guiding to people to show up, and we just show up with them and show them around, uh, and also for our, our research in Saudi Arabia. Um, but tonight, uh, we're focused in on has Noah's Ark been found? It is a controversial site for those who are really into this topic. You probably have strong opinions or, or just have heard the pros and cons already. But then there's probably those who have, uh, you know, don't know anything about it or heard that it's on Mount Ararat and seen videos on YouTube or past news articles about, you know, possible wood being found on Mount Ararat. Uh, so, uh, we're going to go through uh, basically the historical research that's been done at this site, um, and then uh, what's the latest updates and what's going on moving forward. And so I'll just jump right into it because I do have a number of slides, uh, and I want to make sure everyone can um, uh, get home safely after this, or I can go to sleep later. <laughs> we're not going to stay up too late. Anyways, um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the discovery of the site. Um, now, it first hit the news on September, uh, it was actually discovered September 11, 1959, by a Turkish army captain, Ilhan Durupinar. And about a week later, it hit the Turkish press without any photographs. Uh, but here's the first news article right there in Turkish, mentioning Nuhum Gimisi, or Noah's boat, and that it had that this boat shaped object had been found in the mountains of Ararat. Now, what was going on was the uh, Turkish army captain, Ilhan Durupinar, his job was to make maps for Turkey, and he was doing his job, and he noticed when he was looking at these high-altitude uh, Air Force photographs that there was a boat-shaped object that kind of popped out. And so he got excited, and, and pretty soon the press found out, 
And the first uh, photographs were published in October 1959 um, in American press. And then here, this is a screenshot from Turkey's Hayat magazine, which is their version of Life magazine at the time. And um, that got uh, an American expedition um, going so that in June 1960, um, a group of Americans uh, from uh, different areas of the United States, including one archaeologist and a professor of photogrammetry, uh, went out there and met with the Turkish army and even Captain Durupinar. And they went and there was the first team on the ground to investigate this boat formation. And here is one of the photographs, a color photograph of on the ground. And you can see this boat shape sitting in the middle, middle of this um, earth flow or mud flow. And here's another photograph from that expedition. Now, one of the people on that trip was a reporter, and he wrote up the story for the American Life magazine. And that was on, in the September 5th issue of 1960. And because of that write-up, uh, a young Ron Wyatt, I think he was in college at the time or just started his career, he saw the article and was really intrigued by it. Now, they came back after the expedition. Most of the people thought it was just a natural object or a freak of nature. Uh, but a couple of them believed that they were too negative and that it should be more uh, should be investigated more. One of them was Dr. Arthur Brendenberger from Ohio State University. And he kept mentioning how he's never seen an object like this in his career. And it looked like a ship to him. Now, a year later, in 1961, uh, the famous Turkish photographer, Ara Güler, was hired by the Turkish military to fly an airplane at lower altitude and get a lot of uh, photographs. And many of these, most people, at least in the U.S., didn't know about. There, everyone had seen the 1959 uh, aerial photographs that were high altitude, but these low altitude ones um, were, uh, let's say, in the last 20 or 30 years, been made more available online. And he even has a museum. Now he's passed away, but there's a museum of, which features his photographs um, in Istanbul. So if you're there, they can even show you their archive and show you uh, different photographs like this one you see on the right side that shows this boat formation sitting there in the mud flow. And here's a couple more photographs from that uh, low altitude flight that he uh, took with the Turkish military. The site, uh, so this was 1961, the site kind of uh, died down and got out of the news. It was uh, in the, early, uh, the late 1970s that Ron Wyatt, uh, um, he was a nurse anesthetist from uh, Madison, Tennessee, and he became really interested and wanted to go see this site. When he read in Rennie Norbergen's ARC file book, the names of everyone who saw, who was on that 1960 expedition, he was able to contact them and get some information about their trip. And so he wanted to go see it. So he took his two teenage sons and he went out there in, I believe it was 1977. And on that trip, he was able to initially see the site and, and for him that settled it. He believed that this had to be investigated more and that it's possibly the buried remains of Noah's Ark. Now, after he made that initial trip, he came back in the eighties and into the early nineties and did most of his research and it was because of Ron that we're basically here talking about it. He he made the news a lot about it. Uh, he did a lot of geophysical research that got others interested in the site, including the Turkish scientists. Uh, here are some photographs of Ron's geophysical surveys. Now, this one involved metal detectors in which they found a pattern of metal that only existed in the boat formation, suggesting that the, this was not a natural object. He also used ground penetrating radar. Um, and him and Sally Barak Tuton and John Baumgartner and David Fazold, uh, these are some of the initial researchers who were able to use GPR for the first time. Um, and so this is a way to peer under the earth and see stuff without having to excavate. And so it, the scan suggested that there were um, periodic reflections that were not natural, that they were in a certain pattern, um, and they were showing uh, layers and angles suggesting a man-made object that's below the ground. And so from Ron's data, he was able to make some diagrams, and he, he did meetings across the United States promoting this as the buried remains of Noah's Ark. 
Uh, besides his geophysical surveys that he did, he also got permission to uh, basically uh, uh, shave part of the dirt off one of the sides. And it suggested that there was something under the soil. Uh, again, it was a difference in soil color. And this, this is not a solid object. Um, we'll go back to this, that slide. And so he believed that the, these were the decayed remains of the rib timbers on a boat and that naturally you would not get this um, uh, parallel lines or uh, columns there that you see on the slide. Um, on top of that, in 1987, the Turkish government decided that they needed a visitor center there for the tourist. And so they dedicated the area as a national park. Um, and they call it, if you ask them today, that they'll call it the shape of Noah's Ark or the shadow. Um, and so you have this, you know, uh, natural formation, they'll say, most of them, that looks like Noah's Ark, but they're willing to help the tourists out and take, who want to take pictures of it. And so they built this visitor center. But on that trip, when Ron was there, they asked him to uh, show the radar, how it worked. And when Ron scanned part of the boat at the lower end, he was able to see something near the surface that the governor at the time uh, told a Turkish military officer or soldier to dig up. And Ron pulled out this uh, uh, rectangular rock that uh, looked like petrified wood. Um, in fact, it had uh, carbon in it that they were able to determine, uh, suggest that it was once living matter. Um, and then they thin sectioned it. And I don't have the slides for that, but it was showing different layers internally, suggesting that it was like, plywood, you could say, or some type of wood that was glued together uh, that turned into a stone that was petrified. Um, so these are some of the things, again, that Ron was using in his uh, uh, in, in his uh, speaking engagements and showing in his books and videos that he believed this to be Noah's Ark, because he had found these objects, including this one in 1991, I believe, on one of his tour groups, they found this um, oval, uh, round-shaped object that uh, looked like a a fossilized metal rivet and they had it uh, tested and um, I'm just going through a couple of slides for those who have never seen this object uh, you can just look at the pictures here but what they did test uh, they they noticed that there was higher carbon in the areas where you think would be the wood around it the petrified wood like where the arrow at the top shows then the metal part which would not have uh, been once living material, which would be the metal rivet area. On top of it, uh, besides having uh, showing that there are two separate objects in there based on the carbon, they also did other tests. Um, this was, I think, 2014. I could be wrong on that, but this one was with X-ray diffraction, XRD, um, and it showed that the front of the object with the fossilized rivet looks like to be, uh, had two times as much iron as the backside, which could be uh, you know, the other side of it, which could be possibly uh, petrified wood. Um, so th this was mainly um, what Ron had did on this site be be, um, besides really promoting it as Noah's Ark. Uh, sadly, he passed away in 1999. Now, one of his goals was he wished he could excavate the site and really see what's below the surface uh, versus, um, you know, just showing scans. Um, now, this also got the Turks interested. Uh, so you had a number of Turkish scientists involved uh, from the mid-1980s until now. Uh, here's one report published in a Turkish uh, journal of um, geomorphology, I believe. Um, and in here, they talk about, this is from 1986, I believe, and it talks about the, the boat shape uh, site. Now, one person who is still around and actively involved, and I mentioned his name earlier, is Dr. Salih Barak Tutan. He's now retired, but he was a assistant professor of geology at Ataturk University in Erzurum, which is about five, uh, four or five hours um, west of this area of Mount Ararat. Now, he has published different articles about this site and the different um, surveys they've done and geological studies. And he was early on teamed up with Dr. John Baumgartner, a creation scientist who's still around in the United States and well-known. Um, now, Dr. John Bob Lerner initially was interested in the site, but then later changed his mind. Um, his two, his main report was co-written with Dr. Sally Brock Tutan. And um, Sally, though, has remained steadfast in his belief that this is not a geological formation, but that it is 
the buried remains of a decayed ship. Um, and some of their data from that 1987 report from the ground penetrating radar that was showing what's below the surface included at this one location we're showing this doubled uh, reflection suggesting that this is not part of the uh, bedrock below that there is something there um, and that it was not natural uh, and they were seeing this double reflection across uh, much of the ship um, now the the initial information back in the 80s was shown to Dr. Archigal, who you could say, um, Archigal was basically the father of Turkish archaeology. He was the uh, professor of professors, they say, because he trained a lot of the Turkish professors today. Now, he's no longer around, but he was the person who discovered the evidence for the Hittite Empire, for example. And in 1984, he, uh, or 85, he was showing the initial information with the uh, scans and surveys um, and the photographs, and he De decided that this was definitely a buried uh, ship that was decaying there and that it should be preserved. Um, but uh, since that time from 19, um, the 80s into the 90s, uh, no other work had been done. Um, after Ron uh, stopped doing his uh, work out there, uh, Fazeld was no longer doing any work, and he, in fact, passed away in the late 90s, too. Um, but it wasn't until about 2000, in the mid-2000s, or after 2010, um, it was 2014. <laughs> it was in 2014 that uh, John Larson, um, an engineer from New Zealand, got involved. And um, I had been a roommate of John in an archaeological dig in Jerusalem in 2000, um, I think it was five, I first met him, and in 2006. Um, and he was, uh, I introduced him to um, uh, Zafir, and Zafir was able to get uh, John a permit to do ERT surveys there on the boat formation in 2014. So in October of that year, a group of us went over there and I brought in a bunch of, um, a couple of media guys and we were documenting John's work on the site. And John then put out a website. Now these are images, most of these are from his website. So you can just go there and check it out yourself and see what he has concluded. Uh, Nozarkscans.nz or NZ as they say. And in there you'll see this You've probably seen some YouTube videos about this too. This famous uh, hall shape, uh, kind of looking down from like below the ground up at it. And he believed that this was uh, the hall of Noah's Ark that was preserved still deep underground. And his website has many graphics and explanations. Again, you can check that out on your own. And I was there for just to document the work. This is all John's conclusions. Uh, but I did talk to him a lot, I have many. I don't know if it's hundreds, but I have many emails going back and forth with him uh, from a number of years ago, just trying to understand what he was concluding and the results. Now, he believed his results were showing a double hull, a very thick outer hull, and then this inner hull that was basically the size of what you see today, the Derupinar site. And um, it's it's kind of hard to explain without you going on the website and looking. Um, and so, the, anyways, this became kind of a famous image that's been all of the internet and YouTube videos, um, even news reports back in 2019 picked up on this um, and showed the 2014 work. Um, this some things to clarify, though. Uh, this hall shape is not directly underneath, at least what he was saying, the preserved part. It's actually just on the eastern side. Here is a 3D a video, what you can say, a graphic made into a video by John. And um, and again, so the angles you can, I call it a beached whale. It has that look underground, this uh, shape. And um, and then this is what was in the news back in 2019 about the Durupiner site. Uh, the, this ERT scan that John did, uh, he had 13 scans done over that 10 day period. Uh, and I don't think anyone before that had done something like this. And so this is why this was very important. Uh, and it really got the, the latest efforts um, started uh, because of this hitting the news and people became more interested in the site after Ron Wyatt had passed away. Now, fast forward until 2019, we were there. Um, I had organized a trip with uh, a team from the United States to do GPR 
uh, to see below the ground um, using modern GPR and also LIDAR, which is laser to map the, uh, to basically recreate the whole site uh, with, you know, uh, centimeter accuracy. And, um, and this was all filmed by the Science Channel, which is owned by Discovery. And so in October of 2019, over a four day period, they were able to scan the site with two different types of antennas and do all the LIDAR and they got over, um, I think a half billion, I think it was 500 million um, laser points so that they were able to recreate the site um, above ground and combine the two data sets to see what's below the ground and how it affects what you see above the ground. Now, the most interesting thing about this, they turned the data over. So this team was just there to collect the data. We didn't know who they were. Uh, they were hired to have a mutual acquaintance had emailed me and said, hey, I'd like to help on Noah's Ark. What, what are you guys doing this year? And I said, well, uh, we would like to scan the boat, but the season's coming fast and end. And we had like a couple of weeks to get this all done, fundraise, get a team out there, get everything done. And he contacted a friend of his who uh, they do GPR and LIDAR. And within that two week period at the end of September and early October, it all came together. And the week before they showed up, we had uh, bad weather. But when they showed up that week, Every day was perfect weather. Um, it was amazing. And um, then the, we had this film crew from Britain filming for the Science Channel there. And what was the most interesting thing is they turned this data over to a, another scientist who trains archaeologists. He's an archaeologist himself, but he's a GPR expert. And he um, was just a third-party person hired to analyze the data. He had nothing you know, dealing with us before. He wasn't for or against the site being Noah's Ark. Um, but when he saw the data, he said there were some really interesting angular structures below the ground, specifically at this location, about 20 some feet below, seven meters. Um, this is the lower western end of the boat formation. He was seeing these angular structures that he said is suggestive of something man made, and that if he was to do an excavation, he would excavate right there. Um, now, this uh, data. Uh, they showed it uh, some of it on the science channel. Now, what's really interesting was the most of the people. I think they, they had four guys from that, or four people from that production company there, um, and they basically said they were agnostic or atheist. Um, they were just hired to do a film project. And when the one day when they started seeing some of the parallel lines show up, uh, this is not the scan though. There's another one where they were actually on their screen seeing this parallel lines about nine feet down show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, down there is about two feet down. So that's a linear structure, basically right, right along this, uh, um, right near the rocks here. So looking right, right down through there. Mm -hmm. It's pretty shallow though. It's still only about maybe two feet deep. But over here in the in the line, line scan of over here, I can still see data. Um, yeah. But I can't bring it up. Um, I can't change the gain to bring it up. Um, in the grid scan yet. Right. That's computer stuff. So, let's see if we can change colors here. Hey. Oh, there you go. That's a whole, the whole grid? Yeah, that's the entire thing. That's the thing is it's such a small view where did it there? Okay. See where these red lines are? That's what, uh -huh. that's where I'm looking. What that's the depth. Yeah. Go a little deeper. Let's see if anything popped out. Oh, there's a little bit down there, right there. You can kind of see. Same place. Yep, exactly. There you go, right, right along the uh, edge of the grid. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. But oh, there you go. There you go. It's like a cross section. Yep. Too. And that's eight, nine feet down. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's nice. This is big stuff over here yeah. too, huh? 
Yep. Maybe. Yeah, maybe so, something. That also could be if, um, uh, from the one. Let's see. That would be. That's the very. So that's that line right there. Uh -huh. um and that could be just it's uh, slightly decoupled right there so that could just be ring down um from being decoupled right there at that that little jump oh, so okay. cuz uh, that's why oh, okay. decoupling is bad is cuz it will ring down um gotcha. and and since it's consistent right there um which matches up with that for that first you know Edge. 8 feet of yeah that I can't rule that out I can't you know yeah, sure. one, one way or the other but that in the middle stuff, yeah that, the, that linear stuff uh, or, yeah that uh, cross one that one right there right there. in the middle of the grid wow oh yeah well, i guess we'll see so we got stuff to work with that's for sure yeah and getting really excited um this guy the main guy in charge i guess he would be the producer uh who's an atheist he said he called his grandmother that night who was like a catholic believer and believed in the bible and he was so excited to tell her that they might have just seen the remains of noah's ark below the ground and so um anyways it was exciting to see something like that happen um as this is going on as we're collecting this data now uh here again is where that those angular structures are i overlay this graphic on the boat formation there um and then here are, this is actually some of the areas where we were, we were seeing some of the parallel lines, um, but the one that got the guy uh, really interested that they show on the Science Channel uh, TV episode. It was all done back in 2019 and, and analyzed in 2020. And everything was left alone. Um, uh, it was earlier this last year, I talked to Dr. Sally Brock Tuta and I said, hey, do you know somebody who could reanalyze our data as a second opinion just to see what they could find? And he said, oh yeah, I know this lady. She's an expert, has 40 years experience in this field. She's a geophysicist from the United States and she probably will do this for free. And so we sent her all our gigabytes of data and, um, and we got the initial results back just about, let's see, it was the end of November. I think I had a, a Zoom call with her and they're still going through the data but she said she had found some really interesting features. She wanted to know if we had dug a tunnel on the site, but she was seeing a, a void-like tunnel going down the middle of the boat. Um, I believe the it was shown to be about four, it started at about four meters and then going down to six something meters. So big enough, she said, for somebody to walk through. Uh, she called it a tunnel. She thought maybe that they had put utility lines there. I said, no, this is the middle of a, like a, a land slide. Uh, mud flow. There's no utility lines ever dug there. Um, and so she sent us this graphic and um, here's the first one I want to point out. Now, she was also finding a parallel one just to the left on the western edge of the boat formation. So down, this is the upper end of the boat. When you look at the bottom of the screen where the arrows are pointing at. And this, as she was saying, is uh, a tunnel that is not filled in yet. Like she said, it's not mud or anything else it's air um and it's big enough so someone to walk in and go and there's a, a broken up one to the left of it but this one that's down the middle she said it's pretty well preserved and it goes down to the middle of the ship where there's a big rock but this is below where that rock is and what was really interesting she said that it opens up to a central um uh big void like a big room she called it in the middle of the ship so this will again be below where that rock you see and I'll show some photographs later. I've been there so many times, I assume everybody knows what I'm talking about sometimes. But um, anyways, this red area that you've seen in the arrows there, that are, that are pointed out and um, I put a yellow box around. This is the middle of the ship where there's a rock outcrop, um, which, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, and um, she was saying that below that, there's a pretty big room that goes down from, um, I'm gonna have to look, let's see. Uh, it's saying seven meters all the way down. It's even before seven meters depth, but it's going all the way down from seven meters to 13 and a half meters. So a pretty good size um, uh, room. Now, if you've ever been to the Kentucky Ark the, by uh, Answers in Genesis, the Ark Encounter, you'll know they actually have a kind of a central atrium where they, they say like, okay, maybe this is how the light and air got through all the, the three floors of the boat. We don't, of course, don't know what this is yet, but it's interesting that she was able to 
um, look at the data and see this tunnel, um, maybe the central hallway <laughs> and a possible uh, broken up one on the left side going to the top of this big pit, you can call it a room as she called it. Um, again, uh, things need to be excavated to really determine what that is, but these are, again, suggestive that there's something there. Uh, and we do have a surprise for another part of these scans. She was able to show um, that uh, we're not releasing yet because we have um, some Israeli press interested in the story, and so we have to keep it for them. Then we can maybe do a follow-up, or we can just put out the link, and you guys can read about it later. Um, but she was able to get some more data uh, from these scans, suggesting a layout of uh, what's below the ground. So let's put it that way. Um, now, in 2021, so again, that was all the 2019 scans right before the pandemic. Uh, 2021, the Turkish governor's office for that province hired their own team to get their own data. Now, they focused mainly on ERT. Now, I'm using these acronyms. I should explain. So we talked about GPR, which is using radar, this electromagnetic signal, and it fires this frequency into the ground, and it can map out the reflections coming back, and then the use of archaeology, obviously. And they also use ERT, which is use, using electrical currents to see uh, to map out the resist of nature, what's below the ground. Um, and so if it's a pocket of air, you know, electricity uh, won't flow as fast through that as it would through something like water or metal. Um, and so they can collect the data, and then the software will interpret it and make, you know, 3D models. And so use it a lot for geology and oil exploration and also archaeology. And so John Larson in 2014, when we saw that boat-shaped hull, um, he uh, did 13 scans across the site with a cable uh, just a little longer than the boat formation. So the boat itself is 515 feet long. Um, and so his cable, uh, he, he mainly focused his scans on that actual boat formation. Well, the Turks, they wanted to see how the, does this formation fit in the surrounding environment, in that mud flow? Is it unique or is it part of the mud flow and that boat formation you see at the top? Is this a surface feature? You know, what's going on in there? So they did 39 scans with a cable that was three times as long as Larson's, and they went way out into the mud flow. So they didn't just focus on the boat formation. They focused on the whole area. Now, uh, here are some photos I took. Uh, we videoed them. We were... Um, I was there uh, for it, but again, this is not my work. So we were able to talk to the scientists and uh, and uh, just you know document their work. We had permission to do this. In fact, uh, it was because of our constantly nagging the governor's office, and the tourism and uh, culture and ministry officials that this is why they did it. Um, but at any rate, uh, sadly, this data and here's some more pictures from that um, early November 2021. Uh, effort. But sadly, uh, it has not been officially released. And so and I know a number of people have been asking me, you know, can you find out what's going on? And we did go in January, I think it was, or February of the next year in 2022. Here's a fair with uh, the main scientist, Ojan. And we went to his office in on the Black Sea coast in Turkey. And it, he said we couldn't record anything because he said this data belonged to the governor's office. But he showed us on his computer and phone, some of the initial results. And all I can say is that he, what I can just kind of describe it. He was showing that there was an object uh, below the ground that's only below that boat formation that is not part of the mud floor around it. Uh, so then we can debate, you know, is this, this a piece of rock right there or is it Noah's Ark, you know, which could be a petrified boat, which is rock. <laughs> but anyways, someday we'll find out. Um, but anyways, he was excited, and his wife even got him a model and saying and he was the conqueror of Noah's Ark because he was able to do this very extensive ERT scans uh, that, uh, in 2022. Um, now, later that, uh, or 2021, now later in 2022, in November, uh, the Turkish uh, science, other scientists got involved. Uh, the local university, uh, Agri University, um, for that province, we're in the province of Augury, and I'm saying it the American way. Um, I think they see something like the Audrey, uh, but you know, Mount Dara, it's called Audrey Da, the Mountain of Pain. Um, so this province, they have a, an official government university there, and they combine their efforts with Istanbul Technical University, E2, uh, and those two uh, groups of scientists went out and did a surface survey 
of the um, area, including the boat site and the, the hills around it. Um, and then in the fall of last year, um, they uh, announced their results about a year later. And so this would be uh, October of 2023. Uh, they had their uh, symposium on Noah's Ark and Mount Ararat, which they hold every two years. And we had a number of Americans there involved, um, including Andrews University from Michigan um, and some other universities. And I, I gave a couple of papers about our efforts. Um, but they announced at this symposium uh, that wasn't filmed, but uh, this uh, actually it was filmed. It's on their YouTube channel, but it's all in Turkish. But in, in a seven minute announcement, they basically said that they had found pottery in that region that dates all the way back to the start of the pottery age, as they called it. Uh, they said the Calcolithic um, age. And they said this is the oldest pottery for that region, for Anatolia right there, uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, humans have been active in that area for a very long time. So for a biblical standpoint, we would say, well, you know, after the flood, those are planted in this area of, of the mountains we are to, and people were active there after the flood until now. Um, anyways, they made this announcement in Turkish. Um, I do have this video um, that I have filmed of it with the uh, English translation, um, and they have on their YouTube channel the full two-hour um, symposium um, um, ceremony or the, the uh, start of the ceremony and all that, which included this announcement. So if someone's interested in actually really like digging into this, I can put that up on our YouTube channel and give it to the group and you guys can put it up. Um, and here's some pictures of uh, myself and Zafir with some of the uh, scientists there. There's an archaeologist, Dr. Randall Yonkers, who's been involved in archaeology in the Middle East. Um, uh, Oktay Belli, who's uh, a historian, a Turkish official who's been involved with these Noah's Ark symposiums, and then Dr. Kaya, who's a geographer and the vice rector of Agri University and one of our good friends. Um, now, Dr. Kaya then announced on the third day of the symposium, the results of this to the general press and the Turkish government press agency, AA, Anatolia Agency, uh, or Anadolia, Dulia Agency, put it out for the Turkish news to pick it up. And then from there, it went worldwide. And so you, we had, uh, in fact, it was in the um, trending stories on Apple News for a while. Uh, we had Poplar Mechanics. Uh, uh, CBN interviewed me for um, their take on the story. Uh, there was some uh, errors in the story because they were, a lot of these sources were translating the Turkish press story, uh, which didn't mention all the, the pottery and everything, but they were just given dates and such. And so... Uh, but anyways, uh, this story went around the, the world uh, in different languages. Um, and so now the Turks have announced that they're going to add Andrews University. So this American University from Michigan with um, E2 from um, Istanbul and Agri. So these three universities have announced that they will continue their studies because their initial survey has been positive for finding um, uh, archaeology remains in the region. Um, and to further study the boat formation itself um, as part of their regional effort. And so we're very excited. Um, we have been uh, invited um, to be a part of it, uh, not as scientists, but maybe just to watch. <laughs> I just want to be there and ask questions. But uh, anyways, you know, whatever they find, I'll, I'll be interested in it. Um, now, most people assume, you know, especially if they're a critic, they'll say this is a geology formation. Uh, but you know, when they talk about that pottery that was found, um, right above this arc site, the boat formation, there are archaeological ruins way, way up near the Iranian border there. So about a mile away, including this site here that this is a graphic from another website. Uh, but anyways, there, there's a lot of I've walked above there through that mud flow and found pottery pieces myself. So it definitely um, people have been living there for a long time. Uh, I, I'm going to switch gears now. So that's kind of like the efforts from the 1959 discovery through Ron Wyatt up to the latest, you know, geophysical scans, the GPR and ERT. Um, and now I'm just going to go through a couple. Uh, I know they might have questions from those who disagree with that this is Noah's Ark or who have heard otherwise. Uh, so before we get to the questions, though, I would like to just do a little rebuttal to some of the common uh, questions about it. Um, now, again, I am, uh, I should have said this in the introduction, um, I am a trained in uh, computer science or com as a programmer that I used to work for. Um, 
uh, the uh, prison guard union um, with for their healthcare doing their internal websites and uh, medical software in California. Uh, but I've always been interested since I heard of Ron Wyatt as a kid um, as a serious side hobby in archaeology and, and, you know, and doing all these trips myself now living over here in the Middle East. Um, but so I'm not a geologist or archaeologist, uh, but I love talking to them. And, and as those who are watching this, you're probably interested in the same topics. Um, so you can say I'm an armchair uh, researcher, but living on the ground. And um, anyways, one of the uh, common um, uh, criticism or att attacks, whatever you want to call it, is that this is actually called uh, a syncline, uh, which is a geological uh, formation. And here's an example of how a syncline is formed. And when it's eroded away, it leaves basically, they're saying, this boat shape. Now, I presented this. This was a, a, a graphic from an article published, I believe, in 1997. Um, it was co-authored by David Fazold, who had switched back and forth between whether this was a geological object or Noah's Ark. But he co-authored this paper with uh, with an uh, atheist professor. Uh, or maybe not an atheist, I should just say. He's a professor of geology. He's retired now. I think he's still around. Uh, his name is uh, Professor Collins. I, don't, I forget what his first name is, but... Anyways, this is the graphic that he had put in his article, and he was saying it was a syncline, and that was basically a natural object. Now, Dr. Sally Barak Tutan, who has been studying the area since the, the 1980s, and who lives nearby, as far as away, and so he's always over there studying this region, um, he, he says there's just no way based on the formation of the hills there and how everything is laid out for this to be any type of syncline. Um, and uh, since I am not a geologist, I can't <laughs> argue in depth on this point, but I will have a video out because we have interviewed uh, Dr. Salibrock Tutan. Uh, we just got to get translated because his English is um, uh, for people to understand him better. Uh, so anyways, we will have a video about this idea that this is a syncline. That's one of the main things people will say. The other thing people will say is that it's actually a, a rock. And you do see this big rock. Um, fast forward to this uh, next slide, but you can see this rock in the middle, the kind of that white object. That's a big um, uh, uh, rock that's just sitting there. Now, the assumption back in the 80s and the 90s by the critics was that this was a huge rock that actually covers mainly the whole site and that um, the mud flow went around it, causing an obstruction and forming the shape. So the mud kind of built up around this boulder or the, this huge rock, and then due to the gravity, it was flowing downhill, and then it kind of uh, you know made a boat shape formation. Now uh, the, the crazy thing about that is that you would have to have the mud flowing uphill to do that because if you've seen this graphic here, based on fluid dynamics, uh, mud going around an object would create the opposite shape. You would have the bulbous or rounded in uphill and the pointed in downhill. Uh, you can test this yourself in a creek as water or mud is flowing by, put something in the middle and watch it you know, build up and then um, go around the object and then create a pointed in downhill. But this object is the complete opposite. The pointed in is uphill and the rounded in is downhill. Um, now, another uh, point that we like to make, I'm gonna back up, I have these slides kind of out of order. But back on this slide here, this is a, it's in Turkish, but uh, I'll explain it. This is a geological uh, a diagram, um, basically showing the mud flows uh, uh, like, a, like you're cutting through a cake. So you're seeing the arc that's circled in green there. That's the boat formation. Below it is the mud flow or the earth flow. And then around it are the hills. Um, now in the middle of this, this is a diagram by Dr. Sally Brock Tutan is that rock, it says Kaya, that's Turkish for rock, large rock, uh, like a boulder. And he was saying that this is a free floating object uh, that is that rolled into the object, to the boat, or came down with this boat from a higher up um, if it slid down into this current location. Now, what's really interesting, do we see this in the actual data? Now, this is what Sali was saying based on his observ observation of that rock and what's around there that it didn't come from a nearby area and it's not part of the bedrock, that it's free floating in the boat and didn't form the formation itself. 
So fast forward to the 2021 um, scans by the Turks. And I think even John Larson scans in 2014, these ERT scans are showing that this definitely is a free floating boulder that's sitting there in the middle of the boat that is not connected to any bedrock below and, and is not as extensive as people thought. It's actually smaller. Um, and so this boat object has to be defined by something like what created this object. It can't be the rock. Um, and as we talked about earlier, uh, Dr. Sally is saying it's not a geosyncline of any kind. It's not a geological formation. So then what is it? Now, I don't have a slide for this, but there is a Turkish scientist who actually published this paper, and he believed that this was a this that the whole ship itself is a limestone block that rolled that uh, slid down from above. Now, we're at six thousand five hundred foot elevation where this boat formation is at, and you have another mile or so to get to the very top of this uh, small mountain range. And he believed that way up there is where this rock came down, and that oh, he said over millions of years a glacier and the weathering formed the boat shape. And then he published this. And then at the end, he even said that, well, we need to do some, uh, you know, geophysical surveys or core drilling to, you know, really determine what's below the ground. Well, that's been done, um, especially the geophysical surveys. And this is not a solid block of rock. You are finding layers in between the mud and dirt. And so you can't define this object as something that glaciers form. There's no evidence of glaciers in this area right here, as Sally pointed out. Um, now, another point, this is more about, you know, what would, would we even find Noah's Ark? This is, so this is, has to do with the whole topic, not just the Durupanar boat formation. But um, we do get comments on our YouTube videos of people saying, why are you looking for it? Um, you, it wouldn't even exist anymore. Um, I would uh, beg to differ. You know, a lot of people say that Noah's family, after the flood, they took apart the Ark to use for wood. No, they had eight people, and the Ark was 515 feet long, at least. Um, so we're talking about a big uh, wooden boat. Uh, now, traditionally in that area, people use stone for their homes right now, and they have these uh, dirt with sod roofs kind of thing, and they use some wood, but very little. Um, now, we do have ancient historians up to the, through the time of Christ talking about that there was the remains of Noah's Ark visible up to their time, and that ancient tourists, just like today, uh, went to go see the site. And so that does suggest that the boat was not destroyed by Noah and his family, that it just sat there and, you know, slowly decayed away. Um, and now we I have some slides in the, later on that will kind of show this boat formation compared to um, different archaeological sites where boats are decaying. Um, and so we can visually at least see that uh, ancient boats do decay and leave like a shape like this. Um, now, what about the shape of the boat? This is a very common um um misconception or uh, uh, i don't say attack but people look at this and say well no this can't be noah's ark because it's a it's not a box and the bible says it was an ark meaning uh, a box or you know a rectangular shape uh now this is a, a display from the ark encounter site by answers in genesis in kentucky and in there they because their you know replica of noah's ark which is 500 500 feet long um is not a box it is actually like it has a ship hull and they even have a really good video. Their Canadian ministry for Answers in Genesis put out a good video explaining why they believe, based on just um, ship building design, it cannot be a box. It would, it would just tip out, roll over, and be destroyed by the oncoming waves. Um, and they, they mentioned a Korean study showing that. Um, and so anyways, they have a really good uh, uh, graphic up in their displays. And if someone wants to read this in depth, we can provide it. Uh, and also the link to their uh, video. Now, Answers in Genesis, just to be clear, they don't believe this is Noah's Ark. But do, from my point of view, I think they had good information about the shape. Um, and that's what we have. We have a boat-shaped object. Um, now, what about core drilling? This is, for those who are really into this topic, uh, this will come up. People will say, well, you know, Dr. John Bobgarner, he core drilled the site with Dr. Saleh Barak Tutan in 1988. And according to John Baumgartner, who I've emailed, and he's personally emailed me back explaining what he remembered about that effort, um, he said that uh, this disproves that it's Noah's Ark because they hit bedrock, I think there, he was saying within five meters, uh, about 15 feet down. And now I, I talked to Sally uh, about this, who was there as the uh, co-director of that expedition, as the Turkish representative, and as the geologist. 
Uh, he said that's 100% uh, wrong what uh, John is remembering. Uh, he said they had the wrong core drilling equipment. Now, uh, a core they had, I think it was like maybe three inches. I forget how, how big in diameter this core was. And then they had a machine that basically drills down and pulls out a column of material. And then you can see the layers. And so they used it for a lot of times geology, but they also use it in archaeology. Now, as this next slide uh, explains, and this is actually from John Bob Gardner's newsletter right after they did the core drilling, um, he mentions that it's very limited in finding archaeological material because you could be like, you know, right beside a wall or right beside a, a rock fence or whatever. And if you're doing a three inch hole, you're not going to really find something if it, the remains are very scattered underground, like very decayed. Um, but whatever his reason is, he changed his mind later, even though he was saying in his his um, uh, donor newsletter, whatever this was, that uh, the core drilling, you can't really use the results. But now what about what did they find on this? Um, let me go back to here I am with Sally. We're talking ab ab about this. Um, here's a diagram. And it, these arrows are pointing out the four locations that John said they did the core drilling. So Sally said they had this really bad um, quality or, or wrong uh, drill unit from Turkey that they had rented from a Turkish firm. And this uh, drill was using water to cool the bit. And the water was basically ruining all their data, all their samples. So he said when you would drill with water and you'd pull it back up, there'd be no data in the uh, core. There'd be no sample because they got all washed away by the water. He said they needed a dry core drilling bit or method and this was the wrong machine so he said there's zero information they got from those four cores because it all came back empty-handed so he had a different take on the core attempts and again it was only four holes drilled one of them was right in the big rock in the middle so you can discount that but he was saying the other three didn't show anything regarding whether it's noah's ark or not and so this still has to be done i think um to do a, a, a core drilling across the whole site with the correct uh, machine. Um, but what about Mount Ararat? I, I'm going to briefly just talk about this um, because this is a whole topic on its own. Um, now, here's our site. It's a, I say our site, but it's the Durepanor site. It's right across from Mount Ararat. You can see in the background there. One of my These are one of my drone photographs. Um, and you can see uh, that the boat formation is in the mountains of Ararat. There's another... They call it the Tinderic Mountains. Uh, this is the uh, smaller mountains, but these are just south of the big volcano. Uh, now, the, the one of the big problems that uh, most people have today with air rat, um, and here's a graphic explaining it, is that everyone agrees that it is a stratovolcano. Now, this type of volcano um, basically has multiple eruptions that builds up all of these layers. Another name for this volcano is a composite volcano. Um, and so Mount St. Helens what is a stratovolcano. Um, Fuji is, is one. Um, there's a couple other famous ones, like one in um, New Zealand. They all have that one single cone. And so as each eruption happens, it's making this mountain. And, and that's what Mount Ararat is. And so for those who say they've seen an object up there that's Noah's Ark, and it's usually at the summit or midway down, like at 14,000 feet or so, or 13,000 feet, and it's all, always on the outside, of course, because that's how they find it. They say they're walking there and they see Noah's Ark. Um, uh, that would mean that all these eruptions didn't destroy the boat and somehow kept it at a certain level and on the outside. Uh, when, in fact, the, the mountain itself, the data shows that all this lava is post-flood lava. It, it was not erupting underwater. And so everyone agrees, that most everyone, uh, that it's a post-flood volcano. And maybe not even around during the flood, like the, the core of it. Um, and you'll find this information even uh, written up on Answers in Genesis website where they explain that they, for themselves, they're looking for, uh, they're not looking for Noah's Ark, but for them, it, it, this is a bad location that Mount Ararat can't be um, a mountain for the Ark to land on. Now, I mentioned earlier about how does this site compare to like decayed ship remains you're not going to find, uh, in my opinion, you're not going to find a perfectly preserved Noah's Ark anywhere in the world. Um, and we're, you know, we're in the mountains of Ararat here. Um, we're the kingdom of Uartu, where we get the name Ararat from in English. Um, and any of those mountains there, if, if Noah's Ark is found, and I believe this is the best candidate, 
it's going to be a decayed remain, uh, just like you see in other archaeological sites where you have decayed wooden boats falling apart. Um, and, and I think this is what we should expect. And if you even look at, here's a, a Roman ship that they uncovered. So it all depends on the, how, how everything's preserved, you know, was it underwater or, or what type of soil. But it does influence what you see above the ground. As an object below the ground is decaying, it will leave uh, a shape like in the soil above. And so this is what we see today. We actually see the boat shape there. Um, and here's a, the famous uh, Sutton Hoo, uh, is an Anglo-Saxon burial ship in England. If you go to London, uh, go to the British Museum, you'll find more information about this uh, famous ship that they excavated, I believe, in the 1930s um, before World War II started. Um, and even Netflix made a film about this. Uh, very famous ship. Uh, it found a lot of treasures on it, but it was really interesting. They, the ship had used rivets, and so all the wood had rotted away, left the form of the boat, and left all the rivets oxidizing in place there, uh, these iron um, metal uh, rivets. Now, to uh, wrap it up, and then we can take some questions, um, I just want to point out a couple of quotes. Now, this is from 1976. Dr. William Shea, who initially was interested in this site and helped Ron Wyatt out, um, he was a biblical scholar. I don't know if he was an archaeologist, but he had helped Ron apply for permits and wrote up some of his reports in Turkey for the Turkish government. But um, even before he met Ron Wyatt, he knew of this boat shape. And he wrote this article that was published in a creation journal. And in this uh, article, he concluded basically that uh, you know, he he never at this time visited the, the ship. So he's just using photographs and the Life magazine report. And what he was saying is that if this ship had been found on the the famous Mount Ararat, the volcano, uh, there would have been a lot more interest in this formation. And I think that kind of what happened all these years is you had um, a lot of claims being made about the boat formation, um, but you had a lot of people at the same time who were focused back in the 80s and 70s on the volcano, Mount Terra. Now today, you know, the different creation groups, there may be some that are looking up there, but a lot of them are not anymore. Some are looking to Southern Turkey at uh, Judy, the traditional uh, mountain mentioned in the Quran. Um, Ancestors in Genesis, I don't think they have a mountain and they may fact in some of their later latest videos about this topic. They say, we don't need to look for it. You know, we just you know need to believe, which is true. Uh, I believe this the flood happened without having to look for Noah's Ark. Um, but uh, ICR, you know, Institute of Creation Research, another famous creation group in Texas, uh, they have an article on their website where they believe that's actually on a ridge that runs west of Mount Ararat. And I forget the name of that mountain range, but it, it's nearby, but it's not Mount Ararat. And they, again, are looking at a different location. Um, and so, again, uh, if this boat was found back in the 70s, on or the 60s on Mount Ararat, I think a lot of these groups would have been more interested instead of uh, attacking it right off the bat and then keeping up their attacks. And then uh, now no one wants to change their opinion about it, I think. But thankfully, from my side, I think that uh, we have these other universities now interested and we'll see what happens. Um, I think uh, it, it was uh, people's initial reactions from some of these other groups were too negative. Um, and then we had other the other side people saying a lot of things, but we needed to have more scientific work done uh, before uh, you know spectacular claims can be made. I personally believe it's the best candidate for Noah's Ark. I don't get me wrong, um, but I think we need to do more work, and that's where we keep pushing these scientists to do. Um, and finally, I want to end with this quote. Now he this is a scientist. Uh, he's a Turkish scientist. This is Sally Brock Tuton, and he basically says that um, he thinks everything they found so far does not refute the possibility that this is Noah's Ark. And so, um, and not a natural object. That's my uh, summary of his quote there, and I'll leave that up on the screen. And anyways, uh, that is the end of my presentation about the Durupinar site and whether it's Noah's Ark or not. And so, um, I don't know who's... Um, yeah. yeah if you have at, somebody coming this... up, are there questions? Yeah, at this point, if you guys have any questions, uh, maybe just raise your hand and I can bring the mic to you so that people online can hear it. We may also have some questions that can come in online and they will announce those back uh, back at the booth there. So uh, any of you questions here? 
All right. Yes, Andrew, uh, there are other artifacts around Noah's Ark, as I understand it, uh, drogue stones or anchor stones. Uh, could you speak to other things that are in that general vicinity that would support the possibility that this is a ship and perhaps uh, a, uh, a, a, a the resting place for Noah's Ark? Yeah, so this topic is quite involved. Um, there's a uh, and I kind of mainly went through like the historical part really fast so we can get up to the new stuff. A lot of people have seen the old Ron White videos, but I wanted to update people on what the Turks have been doing and what some of the new stuff we've done. Um, but yes, so one of the things that Ron Wyatt um, found out there on his first trip in 1977 were these large stones with holes at the top. Um, and so he had um, claimed that, or, you know, um, uh, believed that these were uh, the... Uh, they call them, uh, if some people mistakenly call them anchor stones, but he was saying they were used to, uh, as weights, balance, balancing weights in a storm. So I guess we would technically call them drogue stones. Um, and ancient boats did use these. And so he believed they were tied to the um, edge of the boat. Now, most of these stones um, are found, I think it's 20 miles to the northwest. I don't know if it's 20 or kilometers, or I think it's 20 miles. Um, in a village called Arzap, um, or Turkish name is Saglak Suyu. So just northeast, uh, northwest of Dovizet, the, the big town there. Now, um, he also said uh, that he had found a couple um, of these, I think two or three, in the mud flow right near the boat. Because a lot of times, um, a lot of people, when they hear about this, they assume it's right near the boat. But when they find out it's you know 20 miles away, uh, some of the critics will say, oh, that's not, you know, associated with Noah's Ark. How can you say that's the boat? Now, Ron believed that the boat came that direction and somehow, you know, Noah cut these stones loose as the storm was uh, subsiding or the waters were going down and then it landed where it's currently at. Um, but he did say that he saw three of these stones with the holes near the top near the boat formation without, uh, you know, so some of these or a lot of them have crosses on them, which uh, he believed were added later by the Armenian Christians. Um, who reused the stones um, as uh, grave markers. Um, we've seen many. I've seen uh, one, two, three, four so far that have no crosses at all, but they saw the hole near the top. Um, so obviously, you know, they were not built or, or created or carved by the Armenians. Um, and then the ones that Ron said he had saw near the Noah's Ark site um, had no crosses either in the mud flow. Now we've looked for many years uh for these stones near the boat and that mud flow is changing over time which is really interesting and which i didn't really talk about is that the boat itself is still the same shape and measurement from the 1959 photograph until now but the mud all the way around it is moving um so then again what's keeping this boat formation there all these years but in that mud flow somewhere ron said he saw three or two or three of these now there's a possibility we might have located one um and so as soon as I get more information on that, I will share. But um, for now, um, I, I can say this too. Uh, Dr. Sally and myself, um, well, he did. I, I, I watched him. <laughs> uh, took samples. Because here's one thing, and I, so I'll just be honest right here that, uh, you know, let's lay it all out. Uh, if you're a geologist, you go there, you look at these stones, they are basalt, which is a volcanic rock. Uh, Ron thought they were another type of rock. Uh, in some of his interviews, he mentioned uh, granite. Um, or he said it's not rock from that region. Well, it turns out uh, um, these are, you visually inspect it. Um, I, we've had three geologists out there, and um, it's basalt, which is the main type of rock near there because Mount Ararat is a volcanic mountain. Um, the mountain right beside Arzap is volcanic. But anyways, um, we, you know, just to leave no stone unturned, I asked Sally if he could do test this, you know, isotopic. I wanted to know if you could date, not date, but... um if you could determine the location um, that these stones came from. Let's assume, so let's assume it's basalt, but maybe it's from another mountain and not air at, you know, just, 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 just to see. Do we have no data on them? You know, we just have uh, people looking at it and saying, oh, it looks like a drogue stone. Um, so he took samples uh, this last year and, uh, and sent them to a German uni uh, university. And we're still, um, he's been working with them to do this type of testing. To, and we also took samples, not just of the, like, I think he got two anchor stones, 
if you want to call it that, and drug stones, uh, but also um, stones from some of the um, the grave markers that are in that area. It used to be an ancient Armenian church there um, in a graveyard. Uh, and they also got samples from just the natural basalt outcrop that's in that area. And so that's something uh, we will hopefully have information to talk about. Now, if you know the logic, logical conclusion, like just looking at it would say, ah, yeah, these came from uh, the rock that's in the area. Then you have to think of another reason for these stones with holes and how they're associated with the flood story or if they're uh, like astronomical or cultic type sites or something else. So anyways, that's so for me, I don't know. <laughs> I, I know Ron's story and you know he did all this hard work, so I'm not belittling him. I'm just saying that uh, the geologists who have seen it have said uh, it's a basalt. So the question is, where did it come from? Was that local basalt or some other? You, uh, I have two questions to ask, and one, uh, you had mentioned that the location of the uh, uh, of the site was very near Iran. Is that correct? Yes, we're about a mile below the border. Um, if I, I don't have a photograph of the whole area in this site. Eh, here, we have an old one here. Um, well, this is better here. At the top of, I don't know, yeah, there you go. On the other side, of that limestone ridge, that escarpment at the very, very top of the photo, uh, the other side is Iran. Um, so you, today you can see the border towers up there. I heard of exposition or uh, s teams that have gone into Iran looking for the evidences of uh, Noah's Ark using the description of the mountains of Ararat. So that's one question, if you know anything about that. The other uh, was the late astronaut Irwin, was he searching on the mountain air, uh, itself, uh, of Mount Ararat, for the Ark in, in the days that he was looking for it? Okay, yeah. So in regard to your first question, yes. Um, I, I think the team that was, the main team that's gotten the news over the years um, with the claim that the Ark is in Iran is uh, Bob Cornuke. Uh, if you're familiar with him, he is, um, he's you know, looked for, different biblical uh, sites and objects like Ron Wyatt has and others. So he's claimed like he's found the um, anchor stones from Paul's shipwreck and believes the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. And of course, he's also involved with the uh, um, uh, searching from Mount Sinai in Arabia or Ron Wyatt gave him a map and he went over there. But at any rate, um, so he did produce uh, a film, I think, and a book about Noah's Ark being in Iran. Uh, and then they had some samples that they were going to test. But, you know, this was, um, what was this, maybe 2005? I, I forget the date they did that, but nothing came of it in the sense that they kind of like died out the whole story. Um, and I don't know of anyone else saying something about the actual site he found and saying that it's something they should uh, investigate more. Um, so I, that's all I know about it. I, I saw um, his material. He had a video about it. But uh, I don't know what his latest is on that, if he's still pursuing his site there or not. Now, the reason why some people say, uh, you kind of mentioned some of it, uh, you know, that Iran could be a possible location is because of the mountains of Ararat, and, which is the kingdom of Ur-2. Uh, and so this kingdom uh, did cover some of Iran. Uh, and the other reason uh, people look in the, uh, these, you know, some uh, minority group have looked in Iran is because of the uh, Tower of Babel story where it says, you know, they, the, after they left the Ark, a group of them um, journeyed from the east to the plains of Shinar. So suggesting a westward movement. And so if you put Shinar in Mesopotamia, then, you know, east of that uh, is Iran. Uh, so those are the, the two reasons. Um, but again, I don't know of a very specific site that has any more data than the, some of the basic information that Bob and his team have done there. And what was your second question? Okay, uh, when um, uh, Don was searching for the Ark originally, he had mentioned oh, he had mentioned that he stopped by. Uh, they showed him a place that was evidently uh, a, a, a place where somebody dwelled. I don't know if it was the wife of Noah or some tombstone or something like that. Uh, what could you tell us about that? Okay, yeah. Um, so this is the village uh, of Arzap, where you find these uh, stones with the holes, the uh, drogue stones. Um, 
So on the northern edge of the village, on the foothills there, is an ancient ruined site. Now, Arzeb is really famous because if you look at the old maps, um, besides Do Bayezet, which was called Bayezet back then, like, you know, 100, 200 years ago, you find this village of Arzeb listed. Um, and one reason is, is because this is one of the best water sources in the region. There's a big spring there. I mean, a lot of water coming out. And so you have a lot of ruins there from ancient times, or two, all the way up through the Armenian and Islamic period and modern times. Uh, and so, yes, there are a lot of ruins in there, uh, in that valley, uh, because people want to live by the water, just like today. Uh, so um, Ron found an ancient house there with a couple of, of, of these, these stones. Now, these stones did not have holes on them, uh, so, but they were really big stones. And he saw uh, a carving on two of them that suggested that this was the Noah and his wife's uh, burial because of the, he's, uh, the eight faces or the eight figures with the boat on a wave and the rainbow above it. Um, and then so he believed uh, that that was the burial site of Noah and his wife. And then behind it was, or nearby, is this ancient ruined building that he believed uh, could be possibly Noah's house, or you know, that's what he called it. Um, and then above that on the side of the hill is this huge square stone uh, that is perfect for an altar. Um, and then you have these uh, large uh, stone forming fences um, for, you know, animal use, uh, kind of radiating out from this area. Um, now, the only, there's a couple um, things going on here. One, uh, you know, no excavation up until last uh, 2022 had been done there. So, uh, you know, to put a name with the house, uh, we don't know, you know, who built the house. Uh, th those anchor, the uh, um, gravestones, those that is really interesting you can see those in his videos and you can see the you know part of the description or the the carving and then sadly you know when you go there now they're gone and what happened was in 1984 i believe or 85 um when they went there i think it was march of 85 with david fazel they noticed that someone had dug up one of the graves there's this huge trench you see in the video um and and the stones are all gone uh then in 2021 uh, 2022, in September, they excavated the site, the Turks did. Now, what they found out is the building that, you know, Ram was calling a house. Now, now, again, they haven't published the results on this yet, but from us talking to the people involved there, um, they did find a lot of um, elements suggesting that it's a, a Armenian chapel. Uh, they found Armenian writing on some of the blocks, um, really um, nice designs on other blocks, uh, two columns in their the uh, west end of this small building and on the other end it had a like a, 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 a apse is that the word it's kind of a, a curved um chamber area suggesting a small little chapel and then a lot of armenian pottery and i did find two graves out in front um but not um the what ron was saying um this was a, a normal sized person a, a mother and child that they did find uh right in front of the, the this uh, building and so uh again we don't know what happened to the other you know the one grave that was robbed uh the villager that was interrogated by the police according to ron the, the villager said that it was an 18 foot long sarcophagus with a giant skeleton on the side this was the, the 84 85 you know grave robbery and i do know that when you go there villagers still talk about gold and giants and um in fact, when I, my first trip there in 97, I remember we had to leave this area. Now, most villages are super nice, but this one can, has been a problem in the past, and they've always been kind of anti, you know, anyone, a uh, stranger kind of coming into their village and not very hospitable. Um, and when we were there in 97, we had to flee out the other side of the village because they were yelling to all the villagers, that, oh, I'm looking for the gold. <laughs> so they said we were there like treasure hunting. We were just taking pictures. Um uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, illegal digging going around in that area, but, you know, the, the Turks did uh, excavate the uh, building. Um, and so we're, we'll just have to wait until we you know, find out what the report says as to um, what it was. But for now, we do know at least the top of that building that you saw above ground um, you know, was a chapel. It definitely looks like an Armenian chapel. So any other questions here from the audience? Yes, I'm going to give them the opportunity first before we go online. I'll answer that one about Jim Irwin. He was definitely um, looking for Noah's Ark 
Uh, he was friends with he was friends with Ron, uh, but he was looking for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat back in the eighties when Ron, you know, and him they knew each other, and all these different teams were kind of competing out there looking for the Ark. Um, I don't think he ever um, had a uh, like a published statement saying like Noah's Ark is not on Ararat anymore. I think what year he passed away, but um, definitely with his efforts had been focused on the mountain. Hi, Ron. Um... In the pictures, the outline of the boat, it looks like it, it has a rocky, uh, oh, sh whatever, makeup. Are, are those rocks that form the outline of the boat, or what are they? Uh, so let's look at, uh, well, here's some of the older photographs. Well, see, this is one of the questions that needs to be answered um, by f further investigation. So here's what's interesting. You have, um, it is a, a, a mud object or a dirt object. So you have this earthen object that's the shape of Noah's Ark that stayed this shape all these years while the dirt around it, um, let me just go to a slide that actually shows kind of a high level view, like this one. Uh, wait, let's go to, well, I wanna show the whole thing. I don't. Okay, so on the, look at this little, uh, the photo on the right of our Euler, um, or, the, or even this one. Here we go. So around this boat um, shape you, is this regular mud flow material, but that's constantly moving every year. It does change shape and you know, erodes, and there's a, a stream nearby. Um, and of course, the earthquakes have um, changed the terrain, but all, the shape has always been there since it was first documented in 1959. Now, Sali, he is wanting to study, and he did get some samples. I, I don't know if the Turks that, that are doing the most recent studies will do this. If, if we get involved, then we will suggest this. But the question is, what's keeping the shape together? Because um, you do have the, the boat shape there made of dirt and mud, and there are rocks in it. Um, but it's, it's actually harder material than the uh, stuff around it. You can say you know, the, the, the dirt and the mud flow. Um, you know, you could theorize and say, well, as Noah's Ark decayed, it affected the chemical consistency of what you're seeing in the shape, and that's why you're keeping the shape. I mean, if you look at these old photographs, um, especially, you, you can see really clear outlines of the boat before it got more eroded, especially when the earthquake dropped away the soil in the late 70s and exposed more of it. So you have some solid lines there in these Aragula photographs, and even in the... Um, we go back to this one, for example, this 1959 uh, high altitude photograph by the Turkish military. You know, you, you're seeing the, the the line of that boat on that east and even the north, uh, the upper um, southwest side is very definitive. And here's the on the ground photograph um, from 1960, the expedition there. You can see that line up there uh, on the uh, right side of your photo there. It's pretty like like something's kept that shape there, uh, but when you walk it, like today, if you go there on one of the tours or just show up and walk it yourself, you'll see it. it's it's a dirt mound, um, and so something has affected though uh, the soil to do that, and that's something that has to be studied. Um, from Steve, uh, going to kind of combine that with a, another question here: Do we need the Turks to do the core drilling, and will there ever be? physical excavations like that done that you can foresee? Uh, well, this is the country um, of Turkey where it's located. So yes, you would have to have the Turks do that. Now there is uh, the whole pro uh, project in place now. There, there won't be another team basically competing with the Turks. You know, They have set up this project with the two universities from Turkey and the one American university. Um, and so they will study the site. Um, and we... Uh, we have brought up the whole issue of doing core drilling because it's something that we think is the next step. I, th I think the site has been scanned to death. <laughs> Everyone's done scans because, you know, that's all they've, they've allowed all, the, all these years. It's non-destructive. Um, but we believe the next step would be core drilling. And we were very hopeful a year or two ago that that would happen. Um, but then when the new university effort got involved, the, these three universities, especially the, the two um, from 2022, they started this work. And we talked to them, they said, well, um, we want to do our own scans. Uh, even though the Turkish governor's office had paid for and done the 2021 scans 
uh, the, those ERT scans that have not been released yet, um, they say, well, we think we can do a better job or more comprehensive scans. And so I, I guess as scientists, they want their own data and not to be dependent on other people's data. Uh, and so these new scientists involved, they want to redo all the scans. Um, and so that's always the initial step they want to do. Like in, in, for an archaeological site, they want to scan it first and then do uh, figure out what they want to do next. And we've already suggested core drilling because it won't destroy the site. But a comprehensive core drilling with a, a dry uh, unit that um, would not destroy the sample coming out unlike what they did in 1988. Um, in regards to actual excavating, uh, a lot of them say no. They don't want um, to do that because they believe it will destroy the shape of the site. Uh, one one of the guys at the university did suggest, well, we could uh, tunnel in, uh, and this is which would be a, a non-traditional method uh, from the east side, which is the left side of the uh, this photograph there. Um, and then that way you could kind of get down to the levels of where some of this stuff you're seeing on the scans are to determine what it is and not destroy the boat formation. Um, so, uh, has anyone ever gone in or entered those tunnels they said that were in the boat? Is that the question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Well, so this was just discovered, um, November. So right now it's snow. And again, they're not excavating. So, and and those tunnels, like the, um, let me go back to that slide. Um, I believe it's at, uh, it's start, you, know, you can walk through it, at least, you know, some are not too tall. Um, so it says, uh, it's, it's starting between five, and from these two slides, and there's a whole bunch of them. So just from these two, it's 5.4 meters down, all the way down to 6.7 meters. Um, just from these two, and there's more that show the, the tunnels higher up too and, and deeper. Um, and so, no, you would have to uh, obviously excavate and you know, dig a hole to get to this. This is not just right below the surface. You know, if looking at uh, uh, five meters, that's you know, 15, more than 15 feet down this, for that one part, and then all the way down to uh, 6.7 meters. And then it leads into that um, central pit, you want to call it, or atrium if it's Noah's Ark. And, similar design to the Ark Encounter. Um, anyways, so that hole in the middle that's not filled in with anything, according to the, the geophysicist, uh, this is kind of like a, a tunnel that goes right to that. We've seen that you have le left evidence of the accuracy of Scripture and the accuracy of the message of Scripture.